Today we are talking about the inductance back EMF and LR circuit. Suppose there is a circuit with the resistance and switch and the battery. So this is a positive end right there and that's a negative end. So the current will flow through in that direction when the switch is closed. The magnetic field that is generated by this current by the right hand rule, you wrap your thumb, you point your thumb in that direction aligned with the current and you wrap your fingers around. So magnetic field will be point, looping around this direction. So far so good and over here it will be like that. That makes sense to you? Having said that, we didn't have any magnetic field inside this loop. Now we're, we are introdu introducing magnetic field inside. And then Faraday's law of induction takes place. Right? Do you remember the Murphy's law? Right? Induced current will be always in the direction of whatever is opposing the change of the magnetic field. Remember that? This idea? So what is the direction of the induced current? OK, so it's increased. So I'm going to. This end is outside here is north and then back there is the south, at the up and down, right? It's what we are creating from nothing, which means your induced current will try to cancel this and oppose it. So it will create south here and then north there. You know what I'm saying? That means the direction of the induced current will be moving in opposite direction. That makes sense to you? So, what happens as a result of that is this is called the back EMF. It's as if there's a tiny little battery and with a nothing but circuit, it's opposing this idea. This is what we call back EMF. Okay, once again, when we call EMF electromotive force, it's not really a force, it's a potential difference. Okay. Now, so if we draw this thing as a usually I is equal to delta V, or in this case E, the batteries, the potential difference over R, isn't it? So it's, you are going to have just current starting from zero and on. However, because of this, see, it's almost infinitely high, the infinite slope, almost vertical spike, but this circuit does not like that idea, so it's going to slow it down a tiny bit like that. But then amount of a inductance, let's say, back EMF that's caused by this is so minuscule because it's just one, so it's not going to know the difference. So it's, you are not going to be able to detect it, but it's technically a little, little bit there, okay? Now, imagine instead of having just single wire, we put a, a solenoid here. So going here and then like that. Then we are introducing a lot of magnetic field inside the solenoid. And once again, if you wrap your fingers that way, then this side will be north and this side will be south. Now, this is a lot bigger than just single loop of the current. So whatever the induced current will try to cancel this by creating north sea and creating south here. So the direction of the induced current is still opposite. It's nature always does what's opposite. So far, so good. So in reality, if you put an inductor here, then that will create a back EMF. So it cancels this voltage of the battery. So in reality, I'm going to change that to different color. It's that kind of almost logistic growth type of, actually screwed up. This is vertical that kind of function, depending on the size of the solenoid. <clears throat> OK, so this is what we learned from last time. <clears throat> well, the back EMF has to not done. Oh, 
actually we didn't learn this from last time. So through experiment, they have measured this spec EMF and then L is for the inductor caused by has to be proportional to the amount of current change in this loop. Before it was zero and then now we have this kind of function. It is zero here and then now we have you know, this is the current at the moment, so that infinite change, right? So it has to be this negative sign means opposite direction, and this is some kind of constant of proportionality. So it has to be proportional to the change of the electric current in the circuit. So far, that makes sense to you? Okay, or we can just call that solving for this L, L, this is known as the inductance, that constant. So putting it on the other side. So which is back EMF divided by the derivative of the, of the current. And the unit for this inductance is called Henry, which is really volt times. See, volt divided by amperes per second. This is amperes per second. And so it has this kind of unit. So far, so good. Okay, there is another way to calculate. This is nice, but then how much is this back EMF, right? So let's put these things together. So from last time, your back EMF is opposite of change of the flux count inside. In case there's just one loop, if there are multiple turns in the solenoid, then we just multiply that by n number of turns. Good. OK, we substitute this thingy into that side of the equation and that will give us negative and derivative of the flux count is equal to negative L di over dt. So far, so good. OK, so we cancel the negative sign and we integrate both sides. Good. So we'll have L, I'm going to write that side first. So L I is equal to N of the flux plus some constant. Good, this is a constant of integration. Now at this point, the initial condition, if your initial current at the beginning when you flip the switch on is equal to zero and it is, then you, we didn't have any flux. This thing did not have any magnetic poles. So this thing is equal to zero. That tells you the C is equal to zero. Good. So finally, your inductance you calculate is equal to N times the total flux count divided by the current. Of course, this thing Is this scroll to usual integral from last time? So far, so good. I know this says this does not make any sense at the moment. <laughs> Let's take an example. So we have a solenoid with n turns in it, and the length is L. So the length from here to here is why did I say? Lengths and with L, and there are n turns in it. Okay, now then we have to find the inductance of the solenoid. Okay, from here we know n. We have to calculate this b with this integral. So let's start right there. I mean, there's a way, and then there's a formula, but it's a healthy exercise just to figure it out each time. So we'll start with this b. Okay, this is the integral of B dot dA. Remember, inside the solenoid, if it's tight enough and if it's long enough, then only direction the magnetic field exists. Let's say that because of the current is flowing upward, only there will be a uniform magnetic field. This is the north side and this is the south side and nothing on our side. I mean, in reality, you have this kind of magnetic field, but if it's long enough, nearby there's nothing. Okay. Now, so inside, 
this is constant. That product is perpendicular. So we take it outside and then we just have this integral. OK. Oh, by the way, where is this loop when we are integrating? That loop is outside, well, along this way. You get it? Now, that will be B, and this gives you the area of the cross section, which we'll just call A. Or sometimes you can call it B and a pi r square if the radius of this thing is r, whichever is given. Sometimes they give you area A, or sometimes they give you the radius r. Okay, so far so good. Okay. So we know the area or radius, one of the two is given. We still don't know B, so we have to calculate B. So let's review this thing. Do you remember B dot DS is equal to mu I, or in this case, NI, because there are N terms inside. And that empyrean loop is not same as this loop. That empyrean loop will be, let's say, which color do I want? Set up like this. This doesn't show too well now, does it? Color, color, color. Does my red show better? You know what I'm saying? That loop runs inside. So that's the loop that we are talking about here. Good. OK, so let's pick these things apart. B is constant inside the solenoid and nothing outside. So this pass integral with curve C and this is curve C only becomes a positive member number out inside here. And this thingy is the inside and everything else gives you zero. And then this N is there because there are N turns in the loop, the number of total current. Then this thing becomes just L. <coughs> this is N. So your B here is equal to mu N I over L. So far so good. Now we substitute that in here. So we come back here. So what we have is mu n a i out here and over l is the expression. So far, so good. Now say, well, instead of calculating this, what we are doing is calculating the inductance. So inductance here, let's remember, is n n p over i and p over i and now we have p so substitute this back in so what we get is mu n square i's cancel did i write l here oh my god this is i right this i and i's cancel and then we have over l times a. Now, if you want to use pi r squared here, then this thing also takes the form mu pi first, and then r squared instead of a, and then n squared over l. How about that? So for service, so generally in case there will be on your workbook, calculate the inductance problem, and this is how you want to do it, instead of memorizing the formula, okay? Questions so far? Okay, now let's talk about RL circuits. So at the beginning, both of the switches are open, and then we're going to close this switch one and throw this switch two into the A position, okay? 
So what we're going to have is the current will flow through in this direction. So in case A, this will be the direction of the current. Good. And then I already told you that the graph of it, instead of starting it right away like this, and this is your E over R. If this inductance is not there, then it's almost a abrupt piecewise function. But this will slow you down. It will create the back EMF on the other direction to resist this, and it will give in. So it's going to be like that. Let's see if we really get that through our differential equation. Okay? So we apply Kirchhoff's law. So this is case A. So if we take the loop in this direction, this is a positive increase in potential. So we have E, delta V. And then there will be a drop of IR. That's the voltage potential difference across the resistor. So it will go down by that much. And then at this point, it will create the back EMF, right? And then I said that back EMF Okay, this, right? So that's, that's why it's minus because it will resist this, so voltage will drop again of L, your constant, which is what we call inductance, we calculate in this manner, and then change of the current, derivative of the current. And all of that must add up to zero. It's according to Kirchhoff's law. Okay, this gives a differential equation. I'm going to put this on one side. So L dI over dt is equal to E minus IR. Good. I think we have done this before in chapter six of calculus. Okay, let's remember how we solve such a thing. Number one, divide by L dy over dt is equal to E over L minus I over L i over l that's this is a function of i so r over l i good and then separation of variable the trick is this thing makes it pretty difficult so factor that out this is my advice most books don't do this but this is my way so negative r over l and then you have i and minus what do you have you flip this over and multiply so you get e over r okay now I told you differential equations tell you a story, right? So the change of current, by the way, this is the current over time, right? Your slope, your slope will be zero if your I is, this thing is equal to zero. When it's E over R, that's E over R, you get it? Right, so we can almost predict this kind of behavior by just looking at the differential equation. But we'll separate the variable and integrate anyway. So the I over I minus E over R is equal to negative. This leave this thing E on this side and the T. And you want to integrate both sides. Good. And this is LN and we are sure. E over R like that and negative R over L T plus C. Okay. E on both sides, so I minus E over R is equal to E to the negative R over L T plus C. So far so good. We rewrite this with a different constant, so I minus E over R is equal to A E to the negative R over L T. My A here is equal to plus or minus E to the C. Okay. Okay, now we apply initial condition. So initially, before the switch is thrown, there is no current in the circuit. Good. Now, so you substitute zero on this side, so you have zero minus E over R, and you substitute zero for the time, so this whole thing becomes one. So A is equal to negative E over R. Good. Okay. Substitute that back here, so I minus E over R is equal to negative E over R, E to the negative R over LT. 
as that. So I is equal to E over R minus E over R E to the negative R over LT. Common factor, so I as a function of time, finally is equal to E over R one minus E to the negative R over LT. Okay, let's check if this thing gives us the function what we want. So initially, I at zero, if you substitute zero, this thing becomes one minus one, right? So that's zero. So we are at this point right here. And if you take a limit as t approaching infinity of i, then this is exponential func decaying function, so this dies, so we get e over r, which is our asymptote over here. Good? Okay. Now, then we flip the switch to the other direction. After that, we open this thing and flip, throw the switch towards B. So this is the only circuit. Okay, this disappears now. Good? Okay, if we do that, then what we see is this. So this is case B now. You initial, at the, we reset the stopwatch, is this, whatever we have after waiting enough so we when once the current level reaches that asymptotic behavior then we throw the switch to the other direction so that becomes our initial current good okay and then differential equation remains the same except this thing disappears now right okay so what we have is negative i r minus l di over dt is equal to zero with this initial condition. Okay, so we have, putting it on one side, di over dt is equal to negative r times i. So for so good, divide by L. So the, uh, this is a lot easier differential equation, negative r over L i. I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you, but can you imagine eventually you will get your i as a function will be e over r e to the negative r over l t. And we'll have exponential decaying function. This is e over r and then decaying it out like that. Okay, and some people call this as initial current I naught and e to the negative R over LT. Good. Now let's talk about the energy in magnetic field. Okay. From our differential equation up here, this thing, right? Okay, let's put these two to the other side. So we have E is equal to I R plus L D I D T. Good. Let's multiply both sides by I. So what we have is I here, I square here, and then I L, L I, yeah, I here. So far, so good. Do you remember this expression? I delta V, because the EMF is just a potential difference. Do you remember what this was? This is what we call power. Okay, you forgot, but that's what power was back, way, way, way back in previous videos. Power, of course, is the derivative of energy, isn't it? derivative of uh, potential energy of this whole thing, or well, derivative of energy in general. Okay, so far so good. So this expression is the power generated by battery. Your battery gives you power, right? Okay, what is this? See? 
your V, delta V is equal to IR, isn't it? So if you substitute that in here, then this thing becomes I square R. That's what this thing is, isn't it? This is the power delivered to the resistor. Resistor see it up, like this is a light bulb, bulb or some kind of device. So this is the power consumed by that resistor then, isn't it? So this is still a power at the resistor. So far so good. Leaving only one thing, so this must be the power as well. Right? So the total power that is delivered by the battery, some of it is used to heat up the resistor and remaining must be stored in inductor as a form of potential energy. Good? So this is also power. Okay, so this is rate derivative of energy stored in the resist in the the in in the yeah. solenoid. Okay. So we already know this expression. We already know this. So how much power is being stored in the inductor? OK. So we set up a differential equation. Differential equation, once again, power is equal to Li di over dt. OK. But then this power is same as derivative of energy, in this case, potential energy stored in the inductor. Good. So this is another differential equation. We multiply dt on both sides, so we have du is equal to li di. Now we integrate both sides. Good. So this thing becomes u, and this thing becomes l i squared and therefore one half plus c you with me too much integrity okay now initial condition if at the starting when the nothing was on the circuit so the potential energy initial is equal to zero then this side becomes zero and then current was zero at the beginning so that tells you c is equal to zero if it's not zero, then whatever this thing E, which we call U naught, that becomes C because current is still zero at the beginning. So whichever it is, right? Let's just call it zero for convenience. So I'm going to push this thing down a little bit. So this U is equal to one half Li squared is generally the amount of power that is stored in an inductor. Let's recall a little bit. What was the power stored in a capacitor? C and delta V squared. Okay, so that you know, this is a capacitor as a review. So we have a uh, power, well, energy stored in a capacitor as well as the inductor now. So far so good? Okay. Then we are going to have LC circuit. So we have both capacitor and inductor together. Okay. Generally, you start with a, the maximum charge stored in the capacitor and nothing here, and then you turn the switch on. So there was a no current. So generally, your Q at the initial is equal to the Q maximum of charge stored that can be stored in here. And then this thingy is equal to zero. But why have it so easy when you can have it nice and complicated, right? So suppose that's not the case. There is already a current flowing through and there's whatever the charge at the beginning. Okay, so I'm gonna 
make it purposely harder, Q naught, which is lower than Q max, and then I, whichever this is, I naught. So let's set up the differential equation, okay? So the potential energy stored in here is one half C, oh, by the way, I had to mention, right, delta V? Oh, what's the nicest way to remember this? Q is equal to C times delta V, right? Substitute that in. So we have one half, because we have Q here, Q squared over C is the potential energy after substituting this thing in. And then we just figured out potential energy of the inductor is equal to one half L I squared. So far so good. So that is the total energy within the circuit between the two. Then it will maybe flow through back and forth. We'll see. If you think about it conceptually, does it make sense all of the potential energy at the beginning is here? And nothing here and then it flows through this but then then it will flow back and oscillate hopefully we'll see maybe the our differential equation will give us just that so total total energy is this thing e plus that thing e they are both potential energy in this case so we have one half q squared over i'll just put c yeah that writing one over two c q squared plus and one half of L I square. So far so good, that's gotta be the total energy in the circuit and it doesn't go <coughs> anywhere. And this has to be constant. Because energy conservation tells you this energy doesn't go anywhere. So far so good. We'll take a derivative on both sides. So that two cancels this. So we have one over C Q and the chain rule. You get it? And the other side, well, this one, plus that two cancels this, so you have Li, and then the chain rule, because they are both function of time, and the constant becomes zero. So far, so good. Okay, what is the QDI? This is what we call the current, right? Change of charge, flow of charge. So we can substitute that in QI here. So far so good, plus LI, the IDT. So far so good. Here's an I, here's an I, divide both sides by I as long as it's not equal to zero and we have a current at the moment. So divide, so we have one over C, Q is equal to L, the I over the T. So far, so good. Once again, the I over the T is this D, right? I. So if you take a derivative, then do you see this is a second derivative? Did I write the I here? Oh my God, that's the T. So that gives us a differential equation. One over C, Q is equal to L. <laughs> And then plus equal sign plus equal sign. Second derivative. Okay. Second derivative here is Q. Solving for this, so second derivative of Q is equal to negative multiply. Divide by L, so one over LC of Q. I'm going to call this equation one. Why does this look so familiar? Where have we seen this differential equation before? That, right? Do you remember this differential equation? 
a simple harmonic motion. And this was negative K over M X. And then solutions, this was sine and cosine. Let's just do it. OK, fine, let's just do it. So we start with this. We'll just guess with Q, our function as a time, is A cosine some kind of frequency plus B sine omega t. And I'm going to do this pretty fast because we have done this before. Usually in your high school level, this is the only thing you need and this is equal to zero, okay? Because you start with the total charge on the capacitor and nothing on the inductor. I'll just do it with a general, okay? You take a derivative and then this becomes a omega comes out and sine omega t plus b omega comes out and this becomes this and you take a second derivative and then another omega comes out and then this goes back to cosine omega t and this becomes negative derivative of sine i mean cosine so b another omega comes out so it becomes this right you substitute this back into equation one here, okay? So on the left-hand side, you have this, and you have common factor, negative omega square, and then you will have A cosine omega t plus B sine omega t. And on the right-hand side, you just have negative K over M, or K over M, negative 1 over LC. I was almost solving the other equation. And then A cosine omega t plus B sine omega t. So and as you can see, these two are same. They cancel. So that tells you omega is equal to square root of 1 over LC. Okay. So our solution, Q of t, is equal to A cosine square root of 1 over LC T plus B sine square root of 1 over LC. Look familiar from simple harmonic motion? Okay, now we use initial condition. So initial condition Q at the zero, whatever we call it, Q naught, okay? If we do that, the left-hand side becomes Q naught and the right hand side becomes a and this becomes one and this becomes zero so a is equal to q naught so far so good i'm gonna do the copy and paste trick yes okay so instead of this a whatever we have is q naught good now we take a derivative of this, so this becomes i, and then you have, this thing comes out, so you have negative q naught, and then 1 over square root rc. So far, so good? Say yes. And sine square root of 1 over rc. Uh, maybe I should, uh, it's the same thing. T, and this thing E becomes plus B, <coughs> 1 over square root LC, and then cosine 1 over uh, square root here, LC, T. So far, so good. Okay, now you apply the initial condition. Right? And that is this. So left-hand side becomes I, original. This whole thing dies, and the right-hand side, this thing becomes one once you substitute zero. So you have B over square root of LC. And that tells you your B is equal to I naught square root LC. Good. Okay, so finally, let's copy that.
So instead of B, what we have is plus I tiny little I can squeeze it. Let's see. Good. Okay. In general, you can combine these two trig identities and you can have some kind of whatever constant and then cosine of omega t with some kind of phase difference. Maybe you haven't learned this trick, but if you add sine and cosine, you get another sine or cosine. And this is Q max. Okay, and this omega, of course, is that thingy. So our omega here is 1 over square root LC. Let's verify if this gives us what we want. So usually, if our Q initial is equal to Q max, like I said, and your I initial is equal to zero, okay? Instead of putting it here, or we can put it here or here. This is easier to see. So we can go back here and let's put it in here. So this thing becomes zero and A becomes Q max. You get it? Just like this one. Now, the other side, if you plug it in here, right? Or the derivative, plug it in here, this whole thing becomes zero and then I original is equal to zero. So this thing becomes zero. That means the B is equal to zero. So what you really want is this. Q max becomes A and then you have just cosine one over square root of RC times T and then there's no sine term. And that agrees with this thing if this phase difference is equal to zero because you start from the high and then it oscillates. Get it? Questions? Okay, let's call it a day.